Before you drive the all-new Nissan Rogue, you gotta ask yourself, how rogue are you gonna go? We talking be one with nature in the desert rogue? Go snowshoeing in Alaska rogue? Or take the long way home just because kind of rogue? Just a question, but with five available drive modes, you're sure to find the answer. Go rogue in the all-new, fiercely reimagined 2021 Nissan Rogue. Now with the most standard safety features in its class. See owner's manual for important safety information. Auto Pacific segmentation. 2021 Nissan Rogue versus latest in market competitors. Base models compared. Who are you texting? My therapist. You text with your therapist? Text, video chat, call. Yep. That sounds too easy. How did you find her? I just went to betterhelp.com slash save. She's a licensed therapist and it's all online. I connect when it's convenient for me and don't waste time driving anywhere. Plus it's affordable. I wonder if I should try it. It's great to talk to someone in confidence. She's helped me sort out quite a few things. And right now you save 10% off the first month when you go through betterhelp.com slash save. Betterhelp.com slash save. Got it. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. We're off and running again, everybody. It is Tuesday morning. We are one week away from the start of the NBA season. Is it seven days? Seven days. It all came so damn fast. Last season ended two months ago. What the hell? I mean, so, like, I, I'm I'm a bit torn on all of this stuff. I'll be perfectly honest. I desperately, desperately wanted the NBA to come roaring back. Because, listen, we had fun with the bubble. We enjoyed ourselves. We uh, made some money betting on pace of play in bubble playoff games. And that was cool. That was cool. Everybody had a good time with that. But it wasn't fantasy. We haven't had pertinent regular season fantasy discussions since March. Prior to, you know, a couple weeks ago, really. And we were trying, man. I, I tried my hardest. I really did. I really, I pulled out, I thought, all the stops to try to get you know, fantasy relevant stuff in. We we covered all the teams. But now all of a sudden, here we are. And all I want is like two extra weeks to get ready for all of this stuff. But we don't have it. So we're diving in and that's where we're at. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everybody. I am Dan Vespris. I'm your host. This is a hoop ball presentation. Our benevolent overlords at hoop-ball.com have the fantasy pass for sale for you right now at $4.99 a month. $4.99 and 99 cents per month for the Fantasy Pass, which has the Brewski 150, Aaron Brewski's seminal list of players. He does it every year. It is the winner. It's been the winningest list over the last 10 years. And he's got another good one for you this year. He's quite happy about it, as you've heard on this podcast. It has the whole draft guide, which is filled with things. Auction values, points league values, projections, dynasty rankings, Punting strategies, head-to-head, roto strategy. It's got the whole damn thing. That's all in the draft guide. But the Fantasy Pass doesn't stop there. It also gets you the DFS Pass, which is a $2 a month value right now. That'll be going up, by the way, very soon. But that's built into the Fantasy Pass. You don't have to pay any extra for that. And you get in-season tools and access. So that's all regular season long. So if you're looking for your waiver wire pickups, if you want pro access, the Hoopball Discord will be opening tomorrow. That's big news today also. Uh, Anybody that's a subscriber as of like midnight tonight, probably, maybe a little bit earlier than that, We basically what we'll be doing is subscribers will get an email with an invite to the HoopBall Discord. When you drop in there, you will be asked to provide your HoopBall username, and then they can assign you to a particular room. If you have a DFS pass, you can get into that room. If you have a fantasy pass, you can get into that room, that kind of thing. So... That's coming up later today. Discord opens tomorrow. We'll be announcing more of that on Twitter. That's a really cool thing that'll run all season long. We have Discords with the pros. You can ask them questions about your team. Right now, I know there's a lot of rate my team stuff going on. This is all in the Fantasy Pass again at just $4.99 per month. Please go get one. Just don't order in. One day this month, you'll be able to afford the Fantasy Pass for the entire season. That's all it takes. Cook for yourself one day that you were planning on ordering in. Dan will thank you. That's me. I'm Dan. Uh, welcome, to everybody, that's been 
uh, listening to the show recently. Friday's show is just, it's a, it's a behemoth now. It is far and away by 20% now. It is the most listened to episode of this podcast ever. And it's, it's running away with it. But we're going to try to blow it away this week. Because coming up on today's show, we'll be talking to the great Adam Stock punt specialist. He puts together punting guides at his website, Elite Fantasy Basketball. Uh, and it's, they're, they're great, man. He's really good at that stuff. If you have questions about punting, you can hit him up. We'll be talking to him about drafting on the turn, where he was in our, uh, our Roto Mock from a couple weeks ago. We also got through the first three rounds breaking down that Roto Mock on yesterday's podcast, and we'll be continuing doing that today. So without further ado, here's a podcast. Well, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit on this one. This next guest and I recorded half of our segment before I logged back into my machine to realize that the recording equipment had frozen and shut down in the background. So we're going to change it up just a little bit. Uh, with most of our guests, we've gone through each of their picks in our industry mock from uh, back on December the 1st, the video mock draft, which went surprisingly well, all things considered. Thought I would completely biff the tech side on that. But he's been kind enough to stick with me here, uh, despite my flubbing, and that is the great Adam Stock. Adam, first of all, I want everybody on air to hear me say, I'm so sorry. And also, because the magic of audio, they didn't really need to know any of that happened. Hello, good day to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dan. If you wanted to keep me on the line for an extra 20 minutes, you could have just asked. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's how it's going to have to be now, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what the hell happened. I think my computer did something in the background, but Adam, again, kind enough to kind of re-record. But we're going to change it up a little bit. First of all, follow Adam on Twitter immediately. He is at Adam G Stock on Twitter. He is the founder of Elite Fantasy Basketball. That is EliteFantasyBasketball.com. Again, that's Adam G Stock on Twitter. Twitter. With everyone else on this show, we've gone through and we've analyzed each of their picks one by one. We got as far as your fourth rounder, so I guess we were slightly less than halfway through a 10-round pick before realizing that uh, things had gone awry on the technical side. So uh, what I'd like to do here is I'm going to read off each of your picks uh, straight through, and then instead of breaking down each one, We'll talk a little bit about your team build overall, kind of how you got to that point, which are things that we, we started to cover pre-tech issue. But then I also want to talk to you about some of the other guys that went around your picks and kind of what that meant to you, how that impacted you during the draft, because the timer was short. We had this as a, a 50, 5 zero second pick clock, uh, so things were hustling a little bit. So Adam was on the turn. He was number 12 in this draft, uh, and his pick straight through Trey Young, Joel Embiid, Kyle Lowry, Drew Holiday, Kelly Oubre Jr., Thomas Bryant, Clint Capella, Otto Porter Jr., Davis Bertans, and Evan Fournier. So first things first, you're on the turn of an industry draft. What is your strategy going into a setting like that, knowing that the buzzy guys are probably going early? In a roto draft, it is pray that someone takes the brawn before me so somebody falls. <laughs> and they did. Joel took him right before you. Yes. So thank you very much, Joel. My, I was praying for Kawhi. Kawhi, yeah, he's going to miss a bunch of games, but he was still a top eight, top 10 guy in nine cat last year. So he was my first choice, but I figured he, someone else would catch on to that and it wouldn't happen. Um, yeah. So I went trade to boost my points, assist and free throw percentage. Those are all the categories you want to focus on early. I thought I could make up for his shortcomings a little later. And when we get deeper in the draft, I'll talk about that. Um, in terms of who else, I was considering if LeBron fell, I wasn't going to take him just because I think there's a chance that he ends up as like a top 25, nine category guy. It really depends on what his free throw percentage uh, did. I just, in my personal projections, I just took a teeny bit off in most places uh, just because of his age. And he really dropped to around 30. Um, <laughs> in terms of who I would have taken if Trey wasn't there, Kawhi would have been first, uh, my second round pick. Um, I was Embiid. Um, that would have changed because I might have taken Paul George actually around the turn. A lot of George's drop last year was due to minutes. I think he gets back to his normal maybe 33 minutes per game. He's not going to play 36 like he did in OKC. But for the most part, his per minute numbers were actually pretty close to what they were um, before last last season. Really, the only season that was clearly better on a per game basis was his MVP campaign. Um, besides that, I thought about Jimmy, but that was more so as a, 
as a partner with Trey. Um, Jimmy, I, I, I think he'd be fine there if he was going to play 68 games, but he probably wouldn't. His game is very roto friendly and it's nice kind of get those elite steals, some nice out of position assists and the top end free throw percentage impact because all those categories are going to dry up pretty quick. Uh, one thing I do want to repeat that got lost in the, the great audio disaster of 2020 uh, we talked a little Trey Young, Luka Doncic prior to everything breaking down, and you and I are actually both ever so slightly on the Trey Young side, and I think it's for relatively similar reasons, but if, if you don't mind repeating yourself on that one, I thought that was a, a pretty interesting point. I want to get back in there again. Yeah, I don't like Luka in the top five in head-to-head, and I think if you take Luka in the top five in Roto, you're just throwing away your league, essentially. I like Trey slightly more because I think his floor is a little higher. Um, you look at Luca from January 1st to the COVID break last year, he was only a top 80 guy, shot 68% from the line. And and what was also very worrisome to me was that he only ended up with 0.8 steals per game. Everyone focuses on the free throw percentage, but the steals could be just as much of a problem. Luca could have a really good year and still end up as a top 20, uh, nine category guy. That doesn't matter as much in head to head because you can punt, but in Roto, yeah. that would be a disaster. Is, is, I, Adam, I know one of your expertise uh, zones in fantasy is the punt strategy. Is you know, I I, I play more roto than head to head. It's kind of my my thing, and I know a lot of people are getting into it this year more so because it's a COVID season. In general, in head to head, I mean, does anybody try to win turnovers in head to head? It feels like that's just an auto punt. It doesn't even qualify as a punt anymore. No, you're talking to a guy who makes a point actually of saying try to be competitive in turnovers. Okay, because I think yeah, hit usually me. I find with turnovers is that you don't have to really pay too much attention to it. You just have to be. You don't even have to be good. You right. Can be yeah. Bad instead of being terrible because almost everyone else is punting turnovers, so you don't have to focus on it throughout the whole draft. But maybe make a couple. Uh, picks throughout the draft just just maybe you find Kelly Oubre in the fifth or something he's going to average 1.5 turnovers that goes a long way because a lot of the guys in those in that range is going to be at at like 2.3 turnovers per game I also don't like punting turnovers because when you get to the playoffs you're not going to be wanting to punt turnovers it makes streaming a lot harder it's it's nice if you have that category locked up at the beginning of the week and you don't have to be like well I want this guy who could get five dimes and I need that a guy who can get five dimes but if he gets three turnovers I might lose it's nice to not have to worry about that (laughs) so I think what I need to do is work on my nomenclature because it's not so much punting turnovers as semi ignoring them is that a better way to phrase it yeah yeah that's that's what I would say and I'm not going to say like I always try to be competitive in turnovers if I start with Trey or Luca um or, or Harden, I'm just going to say, screw it. It's probably not worth it. But if I start with someone like, let's say, uh, Dame. Dame's got a nice turnover rate for a point guard or, or one of the bigs. Then I'm probably going to try to win it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it actually makes a lot of sense because everything in fantasy is is comparative analysis at this point. If somebody in, if 11 teams in your head-to-head league have completely ignored turnovers and you only kind of ignore them, that actually makes you really good at them. By comparison, right? I mean, that's all you really need to do. Yeah, and it, it just doesn't take much. You're not going to take much of a hit to your counting stats. There's a lot of really good low turnover players. Like it's someone like it's taking Demar Derozan instead of a three point four turnover per game point guard or something. You can still get the assists. You can still get a really good fantasy asset, but you can keep your turnovers in control. I don't think it's an either or. I don't think it's be good in turnovers and hurt yourself elsewhere. I think you can be good in turnovers and pull off whatever you're trying to pull off. All right. I know I want to talk more about the guys on your team, but this is really interesting. So I want to dig a tiny bit more. What's your favorite punt this year? Sure. So my favorite punt in nine cat and eight cat is different. My favorite punt in nine cat is punt assist. I like punt assist for a couple of reasons. I think it gives you a really high ceiling in the percentages. I always want to be good in the percentages because percentages has the least um, week to week variance. So you don't, you're not going to get fluky percentage. It may seem like it, but in versus other categories like steals and points, those are a little more swingy. It also protects you a little bit against the schedule. Um, in a week yeah. where the schedule is bad, that's going to kill your counting stats. But if you have good percentages, you can survive. Maybe you won't win, but you won't get blown out. And then on the flip side of that, it gives you a higher ceiling in weeks where um, the schedule 
uh, is in your favor. And I also think it just makes a lot of sense because of just the nature of fantasy basketball. People love point guards. People overrate point guards. I think that was the case a little bit in this draft while everyone's doing that point guard run that happens every time in the third and fourth round, you can clean up with some really nice wings and bigs. So yeah, in nine cat it's punt assists. Hmm. And part of that is also time back to what we were talking about. You end up with a dominant turnovers team being able to lock that category in every um, week is pretty big in eight cat. Um, I, I like punt field goal percentage just because the big weakness in punt field goal percentage is turnovers in nine cat. And that kind of goes away. Just some of the big punt field goal percentage guys, yeah. like Arden, Trey, Luca, their value just goes through the roof. Towns, too, he's high turnovers for a big man. Their value just spikes so much that it's hard to not lean that way. Yeah, I'm in an 11 category league where I, I basically just do a punt field goal percent and punt turnover build because they're they're just inextricably linked. If you're going to get a guy who's just with the ball chucking all game long, he's probably going to cough it up a few times and kind of got to be okay with that but let's let's cycle back to your team a little bit here you talked a bit about Trey Young talked to early players what about some of those guys you grabbed in the middle you had Kyle Lowry end of the third Drew Holiday beginning of the fourth uh you mentioned Kelly Oubre in in our discussion a minute ago who are some of the other guys you were looking at around that area and and kind of how did you end up homing in on on the dudes that you did yeah so Lowry was an easy pick there because he has a well-rounded game but some other guys was looking at I think the Pascal's get didn't I, I think his playoff performance is a little too fresh in people's minds. I was hoping he'd follow you on a couple picks before me. He was still a guy that he, basically his floor is the, is the third round. He's going to play a lot. He's not going to, going to rest. Um, I, I would have been willing to take the risk on Chris Paul if he, if he fell there. I mean, yeah, I don't think he's going to play as many games as he did last year, but he's going to play that on a per game basis. And then Roto um, injuries are hurt a little less. Um, in terms of the guys that went after Kyle, there wasn't a ton of guys I, I, I love, to be honest. I, ja went a couple of picks after Kyle. I don't agree with that at all. I think that requires way too much improvement. Um, Levine it is is fine, but I think Lowry had a higher upside. Same with Drew. Um, I, th- I think Levine's going to lose some touches with Kobe kind of developing and um, – and marking and hopefully coming back to life. Um, <laughs> yeah, having, but, having a pulse, that that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah Ing- Ing- Ingram would have been nice too, um, but uh, I think he's going to go mid three in, in most drafts. What do you do, by the way, and then we'll get to Ubre. what do you do when you're waiting for your turn, in, when you're clustered at the end like this? When you're on the turn, you've got your back-to-back picks and you've got, you know, I mean, obviously the picks went fast as hell in this mock, but in, in many drafts, it'll take more like you might have a 10 to 15 minute break between picks. Do you just load up a queue? What are you working on during that downtime? I do load up a queue so I don't forget guys. I've done that in drafts <laughs> in the past. Like you're like, you just think like, of course this guy's off the board, you know, and then it's your time to pick you make your pick and you're like, Oh no. So I try to fill up that, that queue as much as I can. Um, usually in that downtime, I'm trying to get a good um, really idea of what my team's strengths and weaknesses are and just trying to, think about how the draft has gone so far and what some of the tendencies these guys are showing. I noticed some of the other experts in the draft, they were going after the real trendy guys early. I think Jamal went in the second, Nurk went 25. Um, and then guys like Vooch were going a little lower uh, than uh, they should. Yeah. Chris Shea, Paul. Shea went at 18. Yeah. That, that was, that was uh, interesting for sure. Um, yeah, you see, yeah, uh, Christian Wood, who I like a lot this year, but like mid third, that's that's kind of aggressive. Um, so I'm trying to figure out some of the other tendencies so I can try to plan out uh, who who's going to be there. So mm. I, I noticed that in this draft specifically, everyone was really going guard heavy. So I figured, hey, these guys like guards, but that means they're probably going to have to fill out their big man spots. So while I would like to get guys like, let's say Mitchell Robinson or JV at the end of the fifth and, and they'll be, they'll be there in a lot of drafts. I knew that since these guys went small early they they would probably hmm. be a big, big man around right in front of me and to not depend on that and have my backup wing ready. Yeah, sure enough. They did. Uh, like you said, JV went early five, uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, Mitchell Robinson, Miles Turner, Andre Drummond all went in the fifth round. That's a lot of guys that are, pretty strictly center eligible in there. And so at the end of the fifth, beginning of the sixth, you got a wing and you did get a big. You, well, you went Kelly Oubre and Thomas Bryant. 
Uh, give me a little skinny on those two guys and, and sort of how you ended up at, the, at that pairing there. Yeah, so so for the people who are picking 12th, I, I just want to point out, I think 5-6 is where you're going to have problems more so early in the – then early in the draft or three, four, at least in that, this draft, uh, I found that was the case. I, I thought the cupboard was pretty bare at this point. Um, there's a lot of nice guys in early five, but late five is a little dicey. I was happy with Ubre, but I thought I'd have some better options to pair him with than uh, Brian, although I like Brian as well. Um, I think Ubre has a pretty good chance of matching last year's numbers. He was top 50 last year, and the Warriors are going to play him a ton. Uh, they're pretty thin on the wings still, so I think he can hit last year's 34 minutes per game. Uh, he's not a passer, but with three point guards on my roster, I had Trey, Lowry, and Drew earlier, and Embiid, who's decent um, in assists. I could take his low assists. Um, I thought having Lowry, Drew, and Ubre would put me in a pretty good spot in steals, too. Steals in prior years was relatively easy to find late, but I'm finding this year um, that's not the case. I also liked Ubre because I took a lot of uh, high turnover players early on. This is kind of ties back to what I was talking about. Be at least bad in turnovers. And a guy like Ubre <laughs> can make you bad if you're terrible early. I on. like it. I like that a lot. I like it. We got sort of like, we got two hot button things we can talk about on uh, when when promoting this podcast. It's the Luca Trey fight and then be be good by being bad is now the other one we've, uh, I'll come up with better. No, I won't. I don't, I'm I'm too tired to come up with a better. Uh, the, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the the five six turn that you're talking about because that's actually where I got stuck in one league last year. There's, and I don't know why it does seem to happen like this, but there's a there's a drop off that happens somewhere around pick sixty where you get to this point and you're like, well, okay, like now we're looking at guys where the floor is lower and the ceiling is less likely. How far do I reach down the board to get my next guy? That that's I think it happens pretty regularly around that spot. It's what you were it's what you were alluding to. Um, you know, you you had Kelly Ubri, you had Thomas Bryant. Let me just quickly rattle off some of the names that went right after you here. Bledsoe, Brooke Lopez, Lamelo Ball, Kevin Love, Michael Porter Jr., Lonzo Ball. It's the ball round. Uh, Marcus Smart, T.J. Warren, Derek White, Draymond Green, Rashawn Holmes. You know, there are a handful of guys in there. You know, I'd venture to say, like, a Marcus Smart, pretty high floor. TJ Warren, pretty high floor. But overall, you start to move into players where, I don't know. I don't know that I would necessarily just say, oh, yeah, this is like, this is a guaranteed sixth round guy. So when you're on the turn, you don't have the luxury of, you know, maybe you reach one time and then by the time it gets back to you, you don't have to worry about that again because it's not getting back to you for 25 picks almost. How do you decide how far you're willing to grab down the board to get your guys at this point? Is it is this kind of the moment where you start to say, all right, you know, th- throw out uh, any pre ranks, throw out what other people are doing. I got to go get my guys here. Yeah. So in head to head, I don't think it's as big an issue because you're probably punting, and then you can just be like, well, yeah, I'll take Marcus Smart at the beginning of the six if I'm punting field goal percentage. That's fine. Right. Right. Or- Free throw percentage. There's probably going to be some guy, some one of the bigs there, like Capello or something like that. But yeah, in Roto, I basically just like the next twenty guys are kind of all in the same same range for me. Like I, I, I wouldn't take someone like Lamelo there, and there's definitely some exceptions that went in the next couple of rounds. But for the most part, I I'm willing. I'm probably going to have one pick made for me almost. Like they'll be like, okay, Ubre's there, I'll take him. But the, yeah, that second one, I I think. Like at, at that point, screw the pre-ranks. You're not picking for another 20, 23 picks, 24 picks. Like just take the guy you like because there's no chance he's going to be there the next time around. Yeah. Uh, Clint Capella is number seven and Otto Porter Jr. was your uh, or your eighth round pick. But again, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a back-to-back. So it sort of doesn't really matter. It's a distinction at this point. You mentioned Clint Capella uh, in, in our chat earlier as someone you think could actually still be pretty good this year. Even if he's not that good... This is still the end of the seventh round. This is pick 84 for a guy who was inside the top 25 on a per-game basis before getting hurt. That would be a pretty substantial drop-off. Um, let me phrase the question this way. Could he have that large of a drop-off? I don't, I, I don't see if, it, if he's healthy, or at least I don't think he can have that much of a drop-off and the Hawks be good. Just because I, I I can't see a lineup of Young, Bog Bog, let's I guess Reddish or Hunter, 
Gallinari and Collins uh, being successful. Yeah, that offense would look good, but that's a walking 125 defensive rating. I just think they're <laughs> going to need to have Capella out there for around 30 a night. I don't maybe he doesn't play 33 like he did last year, but as you mentioned, he was top 25 last year. He just has so much room to fall, um, especially in head to head because you're probably putting him in. Um, punt free throw percentage and in that build he was first round last year so maybe he does fall off but if you're punt free throw percentage then he's a top 30 guy oh no if you <laughs> took him in the fifth or the sixth that's actually a really good pick yeah even if you're not punting free throws at this point pick 84 and like he only took two and a half free throws a game last year so yeah it was bad but like you can cover that with two pretty good foul shooters can't you Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Like I had Trey early. Lowry got to line a lot more last year. Um, I didn't really have any drags on the category group. Drew was dicey, but I, I think a lot of that drop last year was a little fluky. He shot 71 from the line, usually 77. Um, yeah. It, I, I thought it was very, very doable. I actually thought it was such a ridiculous steal that if it happened in my main league or something, I probably wouldn't tell my subscribers about it. I'd probably be a little too embarrassed. <laughs> You'd be like, what kind of like, uh, league is this where you get Capel in the seventh. So yeah, safe to say I was I was pretty happy about this, even in Roto where his free throw percentage is a bit of an issue. Yeah, so there's a there's probably a drop off coming, but not this far. I think is is yeah. probably where we can settle on this one. Otto Porter's a guy I am, you know, he's like the guy I can't quit. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep making this one this whether it's a win or a mistake, I'm gonna keep making it over and over again. Uh, you know, I guess it's good that he's going relatively late this year compared to previous seasons but I, I know that they want to keep him healthy they're going to go a little bit light on him they have a lot of offensive options in Chicago what does his season look like do you think I'm, I'm a little concerned about the health stuff but I just know I'm going to do what you did and I'm probably going to end up with him anyway yeah just at this price it's it's just a why not especially in Roto where this guy was a Roto king for years I'm this year has us all wanting to be healthier and that includes our eye health but how do you get vision coverage if you're retiring? It's actually pretty easy. VSP, the vision coverage many people get through work, offers individual vision plans. Enroll anytime, on any device, and start using your benefits the same day. You don't need to be an employee to get employee-level vision coverage. Visit VSPDirect.com today. That's VSPDirect.com. I'm Bob Sullivan, the new host of AARP's The Perfect Scam Podcast. And with Frank Abagnale and other top fraud experts, we're bringing you brand new episodes of America's most shocking scam stories. I got an email alerting me to 22 accounts that had been opened up in my name. Scam was masterfully designed. New episodes available now. Subscribe to The Perfect Scam Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The same way, I was a big Porter fan. Um, yeah, I, I think he's probably going to end up in the 28, 29 minute per game range, and that probably stops like another top 30 season or whatever he was back in the day Day happening. Um, I don't have, actually have too many concerns. He's had so much t time off. Sorry, concerns on a per game basis. He's had so much time off, and last year was a foot issue. It wasn't his hip. I think if it was his hip that they were worried about, I'd be a little more worried about that. Um, I like the pick in eight. I, I didn't love it just because basically right after the pick happened, it came out that they were going to be watching his minutes. Uh, we'll see what <laughs> that means. But I think that just probably tells you that his ceiling isn't going to be that high this year. But in round eight, no one has ever lost a lead blowing their eighth round pick. And Otto, when you look at most of the players in his range, he definitely does have more upside than most of them. So it's really like a a fairly high upside pick with not not – too much downside. Which, I, you know, I, I suppose I should add a grain of salt on what I'm about to say because you did have the first pick of the eighth round, but there's maybe, maybe one other guy in the eighth round that I would take in front of Otto Porter from this list. And you actually talked about him already. So if you, if you had already known that they were going to be monitoring his minutes, would you have still made him your eighth round pick? I probably would have switched to OG. Yeah, that's the guy Just, I'm looking at there too. Yeah, OG, you got always got OG and Bridges. Bridges went a little earlier, but it's it's like those two are my one, two kind of like three and D wings, and then Otto's kind of my backup. But I agree with you in the round. Like you had guys like Randall. I don't want Randall and Roto. I do not want um, Randall. Yeah. I have, I have nothing. I have nothing but disdain for Julius Randall. <laughs> yeah. Every time I'm putting out an article, I'm like, okay, Randall might fit here. No, no, I just won't talk about him. My like I. Yeah. I, mean, I want to do it. And, and Richardson went after, like, I think Richardson will be a little 
better this year, but I'll believe another guard having a good season beside Luca when I see it. His usage rate is just way too high. Um, I don't mind Rubio at that price, but yeah, okay, yeah, that's no. a good point. Rubio's probably going to be fine there. Yeah. All right. I'll, yeah. Okay. I'll give I'll give Jovan that one. That one's not a bad pick in the eighth round either. Uh, but there's just a lot of weird when you get to this part of the draft. So. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah, even and and like I said, this this is a mistake I'm just going to keep making until it finally until it hits. Uh, ninth round, and well, we'll go ninth and tenth because we'll clump them together here. And these are the ones we didn't talk about before the the pod glitched out the first time. Davis Bertans, the forgotten man in Washington, and Evan Fournier, perpetually forgotten man in Orlando. I love Evan Fournier as a fantasy pick. He's like the easiest after 100 guy on the planet. So we don't even need to talk about him because he can just sort of coast along to decent fantasy value. He's extraordinarily safe. Let's talk about Davis Bertans. He signed this big extension. He had a ton of usage last year because his guys were out. Beal missed some time. Uh, But they've got Russell Westbrook now. They didn't, by the way, when we had this draft. That trade hadn't happened yet. So does that change your assessment of Bertans or... I mean, we know with Russ, he likes to kick and then for somebody to shoot, which is kind of all you want out of Davis anyway. Um, do you still like him here? Do you bump him up? Do you bump him down from the trade? Let's talk about Davis because I don't think there, there's not much to say about Fournier. Yeah, yeah. With, with Fournier, that was that was an even bigger shocker to me than Capella, a top 75 guy through the last five seasons. What, like, I don't know what the rest of the league was doing. He's boring. Um, He's boring. That's what it is. He's boring. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Bertans, like, uh, um, I, so I took him a nine. I I don't mind him around there. I don't think you can go much higher than that with with Russin, just because he really is only points, uh, low points, elite threes, five, four or five rebounds and low low turnovers. Um, I do like him a little more now that Russ is there, just because I think they need his shooting on the floor. Uh, the other options at like the three four aren't great shooters. Uh, Denny's probably too raw. raw. I like uh, Troy Brown Jr. as a player, but he's not the greatest shooter ever. And, and Rui's going to hit like one three max this year. Just so, so I think they pretty much just have to play Bertans 28, 29 minutes again. I, I don't think that he's going to improve on last year's numbers, but I think he can get pretty close. And he did outplay this in nine category last year. So I think his floor is relatively high. Like maybe he if he doesn't justify this draft pick, he's probably still going to be like a top 110 guy. So it's not like the end of the world. But then again, as we saw last year, there's probably like top 60-ish upside if he can stay just as hot. Um, I, I think Westbrook coming also probably helps uh, Thomas Bryant um, just because he can stretch the floor. I think if you were running with Rolo, then you'd probably run into some issues because you don't really have a big shooter. You, you'd have Beal and Bertans and then not a ton of shooting on the floor. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on board with a lot of that stuff as well. Okay, this is the present unwrapping part of the proceedings. We've, we've discussed strategy. We've discussed punts. We've looked at your team. Uh, let's give the people a little, a little sweet nugget. Who you got as, and, and everybody knows I hate to call it a sleeper, but I have to because that's universal nomenclature at this point. Yeah. Uh, who's, a, who's an interesting sleeper folks should keep an eye on? Uh, so for me, I'm a, I'm originally from Toronto. I lived in New York, just moved back to Toronto from, uh, because of COVID. Uh, so I've seen this guy up close and I've seen his coach up close and I know how much Dwayne Casey likes the long, right? I just look at that Pistons backcourt. You got Hayes, you got Rose, who's probably going to be a Piston for maybe half the year before he goes to the Lakers or, or whatever. And not much else. I just, I can't look at the rotation and think that DeLon's not going to have a good year a lot of the uh, talk coming out of the Pistons early camp has been good too Wright has talked about how he's trying to get to Detroit he wanted to play with Casey again and Casey's been talking about playing him at the three that sounds like a guy who wants to play right big minutes I think he probably gets at least 28 I think there's a chance he could get 30 and then Mm. who knows what happens at the end of the year with Rose probably gone does Hayes kind of hold up rookies especially coming from Europe, they haven't played a schedule like this. Is he going to play in one piece? You're pre- There's probably just going to be some pretty nice stretches for Wright this year. I think he's got a good chance at top 100. Um, worst case scenario, he's going to be a really good source of steals. Produced 1.9 steals per 36 last year. Good rebounder for a guard, 6.4 rebounds per 36. And then assists, he can maybe give you a 4 to 5. Uh, he's never going to be a big scorer, but given how late he's going in the draft, that's not really a big issue. Um, I think if he 
ever gets to be the Pistons' primary guard at some point this season, he could probably be, be a clear mid-round guy. I remember that big run he had with the Grizzlies at the end of the year. They weren't playing for much, but the Pistons aren't going to be playing much, for much this year. Over the last 11 games of the 28-2019 campaign, uh, Wright averaged 14.3 points per game, 1.13s per game, 6.4 rebounds, 7.2 three assists, 2.3 steals, and 0.6 blocks. That's obviously not numbers he could keep up for an extended stretch, but that just shows you how well-rounded his line is and the type of upside that he can have, at least in short stretches. Yeah, I love it. Were you at all surprised that he didn't get drafted in this uh, mock? I mean, we only went 10 rounds, so that was part of it, but I was a little surprised he didn't go off there in that last round. he, He was actually my guy after Fournier. So I was planning on actually drafting right because I figured Fournier was gone at that point. And then it just, as much as I do like Wright's upside, Fournier is just such a sure thing that you can't really pass on him at that price. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Adam, thank you so much, my man. He is Adam G. Stock, the founder of EliteFantasyBasketball.com. Uh, that was wonderful. Thanks so much, man. I'm so sorry to make you do half of that twice. <laughs> well, that was fun. It was fun. Big thank you once again to Adam Stock. I know a lot of folks were asking about what to do when you're log jammed down there on the turn. We've been touching upon it. I mean, we've been talking about it a little bit on the podcast here recently. So uh, cool to talk to someone who was down there and had to make those decisions in split second. I mean, remember this this mock we ran at a pick timer of just 55 zero seconds. We didn't have a lot of time to think about it. Let's pick up where we left off yesterday. We got through the top 36, and I want to more or less lightning round our way through this. So this should be a three-day process at very most. So we'll probably do about another, I don't know, 40 or 50 today, and then we'll finish it up on tomorrow's show. The uh, There's some kind of exciting stuff coming up later this week on the podcast as well. We're going to be talking to Basketball Monsters' Matt Smith later this week. Uh, We'll likely have a chat with Steve Alexander, Dr. A from Motor World Brew back on the show. I have some plans. I have some plans about how I want to roll all this stuff out to you guys. Uh, But let's make the best use of our time possible today. I want to remind you guys that this podcast, as all of our shows are, is brought to you by mybookie.ag. Sign up now. Sign up now. Stop waiting. They run promos all the time over there, and if you're not paying attention to them, you are missing out on money, cash, actual money. I took out my winnings from Thanksgiving week. I just wanted to do it so that I could say on the podcast I did it and not lie to you guys. I won uh, about $200 on that odds boost Friday. A lot of you guys won your free bet on Thursday as well, so some of you could have won $400, $450. It was so easy. Uh, I've learned about Bitcoin, thanks to a few of you guys on Twitter that have clued me in on this stuff. And uh, it was simple. It took two days. I got my cash. It was so easy. By the way, I forgot to mention at the front end of the show, you can follow me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris. By the way, when you sign up at my bookie, make sure to use promo code HOOPBALL, because the NBA is coming. The NBA is coming. We might get some more stuff. They might have a Christmas promotion coming up here. They might have an NBA promotion coming up here. MyBookie.ag promo code is HoopBall. Uh, so again, follow me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google search Dan from HoopBall. Again, that's at Dan Bespris on Twitter. We are now, uh, I believe, officially closed down. We're not opening any more HoopBall leagues. We're too close to the start of the season. But if you want to get on the wait list, there's still every good reason to do so. Because and the harebrained chance that we get 12 people on a wait list that can all do a snake draft fast at the same time i guess that could happen but it does seem a bit far-fetched given that you folks are all over the globe but you never know so please do send me a note on twitter or email team hoopball at hoop-ball.com if you want to get on the waiting list for hoopball leagues and worst case if you don't get into a league this year you will be on the first mailer that goes out next season to get folks play so you certainly wouldn't miss it next year you would basically be guaranteed a spot in a hoop ball league. So uh, hit us up, get on the wait list right now. And then the other thing is, I mentioned it yesterday, I'll mention it again today, the hoop ball recruiting efforts 
continue here. And and folks, do I mean you guys are continuing to write in. You're continuing to hit me up on Twitter. My uh, my direct messages are open. If you want to bug me that way on Twitter about this stuff, we're recruiting. And top priorities right now are in our uh, DFS division, as we mentioned. We've added a couple of people there. Would like to add, I believe, one more. So there's one more spot on our DFS team for that contributor spot. And then our blurb team, fantasy writing. You learn how to write blurbs. That moves into articles and and so on and so forth from there. So hit me up uh, if you're interested in any of those stuff. Or if you just want to talk fantasy sports, because that's going nuts on social media right now. So find me at Dan Vespers or Google search Dan from Hoopball. Pick number 37 from our industry mock draft. Again, this was two weeks ago, so there are a couple things that are a little bit different. And uh, we'll do it the same way we did yesterday. I'll read through the entire round, and then we'll just highlight anything that stuck out to me as intriguing. Round four was Drew Holiday, John Morant, Zach Levine, Zion Williamson, Chris Middleton, Rob Covington. That's the first half of it. Jaron Jackson Jr., Russell Res- uh, blah, 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 Russell Westbrook. That's a hard name to say five times fast. Demonis Sabonis, Gordon Hayward, Tobias Harris, and Jalen Brown. Interesting things in this draft. Zion, not really interesting necessarily that he went at 40, just interesting that that's where he's going these days. Uh, Most of the guys in this round went about where you'd expect them. JJJ with the injury, but that was Jonas's team, as you heard on yesterday's podcast, so you know he's always going to take him a bit early. This is super late for Westbrook. He'll go earlier now. This uh, draft occurred before the trade. Gordon Hayward went pretty early in this draft. That was at 46. He's generally going later than that. And then the other guys, uh, Tobias Harris also went a little bit earlier than expected. Not earlier than I would say he should go, but earlier than he is generally going. And so, you know, when you dive in a little bit there, was that an industry thing? Was this a one-off? It's almost impossible to know for sure, but we are getting ideas of where these guys are are kind of popping up on things. So not a, really not a ton of stuff to talk about with relation at least to... Round four. Let's talk round five. Malcolm Brogdon, Jonas Valanciunas, D'Angelo Russell, De'Aaron Fox. The uh, de prefixes going back to back. LaMarcus Aldridge. A lot of prefixes there in this fifth round. Mitchell Robinson, Miles Turner, DeMar DeRozan, Andre Drummond, CJ McCollum, John Wall, and uh, Kelly Oubre. So we actually had all three with the, uh, we had D'Angelo, De'Aaron, and DeMar. Fun fifth round. Malcolm Brogdon went early. This was early. And and we've talked to Alex. Alex was on the show last week. Uh, he wasn't all that thrilled about it. This is too soon for him. At 49, someone who was far worse than that after Oladipo's return last year, it's just you're, you're wiping out whatever ceiling he might have. This was too soon. Uh, on a team that had Harden and Jamal Murray. So it wasn't like he was hard up for guards to this point. And um, yeah, I mean, I know he wasn't super thrilled about it either. There's too many guys left on the board, including two of those three uh, D names, D'Angelo and, and De'Aaron. I'd rather have either, either of those guys over Brogdon if you're filling out your point guard spot at this point in the draft. This is a little later, I think, than Russell and Fox have generally been going. In nine cap, they are going to take a slight hit with the turnovers. Fox takes a hit with free throw percent. D'Angelo takes it in field goal percent, but in a counterbalance those things a little bit. Um... Of note, I suppose here as well, Andre Drummond falling all the way close to pick 60. I don't think that's going to be happening in your draft. This feels like a situation where you you got into a room and a lot of people were just petrified of him. But at a certain point, there's there's you know the risk becomes minimized. There's a fear with Drummond, I think, among some folks that he might get moved this year. But I don't. You know, I just don't see a team out there giving up assets for Drummond because he's a guy that would come in and, you know, maybe there's a championship contender that would want him to just come in and play a role off the bench, but it's going to take a decent amount to pull him away. He's a he's a trade chip in a, in a contract year on a team that's not very good. So, I mean, there are a fair number of red flags with Drummond. He doesn't need to play every night, but I do think he wants to show... To an NBA that's really not ultra inclined to pay big men a ton of money, unless they're going to Detroit, I guess, that he can play a full year and be an impact guy. I think he's going to play his butt off this year. So falling into that near 60 range 
There is not much... I mean, you know, the free throw stuff, you're going to have to figure out a way to balance that out, but you're going to get a guy who's going to beat that mark by a fair amount, I would reckon. It's crazy to be able to get a guy who might average three combined defensive stats and 15 rebounds in late in the fifth round. Shouldn't happen. Uh, John Wall here, uh, pre-trade, so just throw that information out. And uh, Kelly Oubre at 60, that's probably about where he's going. Aldridge, Robinson, Turner, DeMar, that's where they're generally going. So I think the interesting names in this round, Malcolm Brogdon going really early, Drummond going really late, and then, again, John Wall, you kind of throw this thing out. I think Jonas Valanciunas actually went a bit on the early side. Not, again, not compared to where I believe he should be going, but compared to where he is often going in that, you know, this is a guy who had a really good season last year and continues to get drafted in the mid-50s. So not super early, but, you know, three, four, five picks before he's generally going. I think the industry draft had something to do with that. Let's talk round six. And that might be where we pause. Oh, we'll wait and see. Thomas Bryant, Eric Bledsoe, Brooke Lopez, LaMelo Ball, Kevin Love, Michael Porter Jr., Lonzo Ball, Marcus Smart, TJ Warren, Derek White, Draymond Green, and Rishon Holmes was round six. I have thoughts on a lot of guys in this one, which is why I think we might pause after this round and do the last four rounds tomorrow. Thomas Bryant, this is pretty early for him. Pick 61 uh, on a team where, you know, we know he has a good fantasy stat set. That's not the issue here. And we saw him put up first round numbers in the bubble, but that was without Beal without Bertans, and at the time, without Wall. Now it's Westbrook is the other guy. He's just not going to have usage. He's just not. Like, there's no, there's no way to argue that. Thomas Bryant last year ended up at number 67, thanks largely to his monster bubble campaign. Where, do this, where does this thing all level off is the real question. He got nine shots in 25 minutes a game, I, don't, I, I personally don't think he's getting nine shots in 25 minutes this game. He's probably going to get... It might still be nine shots, but it's, it, hopefully the target for him is more like 28 minutes a game. Rebounding, Westbrook is going to hurt him there, at least in terms of rebound rate. So when you take his 25 minutes a game last year, which again was bubble plus terrible regular season all rolled in together, when you take that and you say, well, look, he might play an extra 10 15% in terms of minutes played, you can't actually make that adjustment to every statistical category because eight, I believe eight, he might have only played in seven, of those games took place with no one around him. So you had roughly like 37, 38, 39 regular season games pre-bubble that took place with one high usage guy nearby. And then you had the other about 20% or so, a little less, take place with no one around. Now you're looking at a full season with two very high usage guys next to him, one of whom is a rebounding Hoover at guard position who likes to get it and run and needs his big men to go box out for him like a Robin Lopez might, who's you know, lurking in the wings a little bit here. Um, what you can do is, if Thomas Bryant is indeed going to play an extra three minutes a game this year, you can adjust up the assists, the steals, the blocks. Because that stuff will just sort of trickle along with the other stuff. He's still going to shoot a high percentage from the field, because he's going to get really good looks. Free throw numbers, you know, it's, it's tough to know. He's at 74% last year, but you know, what is it going to be this season? But scoring, rebounding, I don't know that you can make the same upward adjustments that you did in the other stuff. I like Thomas Bryant this year, uh, but... At 61, you wipe out a lot of his potential. But this comes back to what we talked about earlier this podcast with Adam, which is it ain't easy to find centers when you're drafting near the turn. You might have to go Drummond at the third, fourth turn. Maybe Valanchunas, Mitch Robinson, Lamarcus Aldridge, Miles Turner, Drummond. Maybe one of those guys does fall to you at the end of the fifth. Maybe. But if not, you're staring down a center collection of Thomas Bryant, Brooke Lopez, Rashawn Holmes, Al Horford, James Wiseman, Wendell Carter Jr., and Clint Capella. That's sort of your next, at least in terms of this draft, that's the next chunk of centers. Are you willing to go get one of those guys? And for Adam, the answer was yes on Thomas Bryant. 
you know, as you look at these dudes, you try to figure out which of them might be able to pile up totals numbers that exceed the top 60. I think of the names on that list. Bryant does have a shot at it, if he can stay healthy. Capella has a shot at it. Horford probably has a shot at it. The other guys, I don't know. I really don't know. It is a little bit easier here. You know, when you're a pick 60, you can make the argument, oh, I'm going to go take the, you know, take a guy that normally goes in the 70s, and it's not quite as much of a reach as if you were at 12, taking a guy that normally goes at 20. But you run into this issue at that spot. Eric Bledsoe at uh, 62. That's fine. I thought he would fall farther this year in drafts. I think I'm going to end up with less Bledsoe than I expected. Brooke Lopez at 63. That's fine. He'll be fine there. Lamella Ball at 64. No thanks. I'll pass on that. Kevin Love at 65. Likely will pass on that as well. Michael Porter Jr. at 66. Yeah, that seems reasonable. He's going to have to do something in Denver because Paul Millsap is old as dirt. Jamichael Green will soak up some minutes. Uh, but Porter's going to be in there to gun as the the backup small forward, power forward type. And I think he'll find his way to, I would assume, 25, 26 minutes a game. Uh, and then the question is, you know, kind of what kind of role does he carve out? Can he be that good in percentages in a higher, you, you know, a longer season? I think he does take a hit there. I'm a little bit less high on Porter than a lot of folks, but this is a this is an okay spot for him. I love Lonzo Ball at 67. I think he's going to be really good this year. Uh, he's going to get a lot of run. In, ter- in terms of, he's always going to get a lot of run. He's going to get a lot of control in New Orleans, where that was already starting to ramp up last year, and even more so this year. Love, love, love Marcus Smart at 68. One of my favorite picks in this whole draft. He's a, he's a gimme. He's a layup to beat that mark. And he's often going later than this. TJ Warren was a guy that I was pretty excited about in this draft, and then this this plantar fasciitis stuff popped up, and now I'm super worried. And the same story kind of with Derek White, who went at uh, pick 70, and he's got the toe thing going on. I need to see one of those two guys play at any point before opening night, and it might not happen. They may both get tossed off the Dan Vespers list because I just can't draft a guy hurt going into the year. I need to see a guy play one damn preseason game. That's all I need out of the preseason. Are you alive? Okay, great. Draymond at 71. That's a reasonable play there. He's going to have uh, an attack year. I've seen him gone earlier, and that pisses me off a little bit because I was hoping he would fall. If he really is falling into the 70s, I'm good with it. And then Rishon Holmes at 72. Kings are ready to screw this thing up, but he should be able to walk to uh, value in that neck of the woods as well. And that is where we'll put a pin in things for now. Might as well, right? We, you know, we don't need to go an hour 15 on every show. A little bit shorter show here on this Tuesday. Uh, I mean, it's not like it was 20 minutes. I think we're still at 45 or 50, right? Somewhere in that neck of the woods. Quick reminder, once again, everybody, to check out mybookie.ag. Promo code HOOPBALL when you sign up over there. Fantasy Pass at hoop-ball.com. Just $4.99 a month. Go get it! That's the most important thing to all of us here at HoopBall right now. And for those that are joining us for the first, second, maybe third time... Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast. Oh, it's such a big deal. It's how we move up the charts. Subscriptions. That does it. It's how we can get ads to keep this thing floating. And drop a five-star review. Please, please, please. I beg of you guys. You're the best. We love you. Uh, Back tomorrow, talking to Matt Smith, who, by the way, uh, briefly... The Matt Smith episode from 2019 was the number two for a long time most listened to show in the history of fantasy NBA today. So Matt's coming back to grab the crown on tomorrow's episode. I am Dan Vespers at Dan Vespers on Twitter. This is a hoopball presentation, fantasy NBA today. You know it. We'll be back at you tomorrow. So long, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation. Visit Hellsberg.com for safe and easy ways to shop this holiday, like free shipping and returns, virtual shopping appointments, or buy online and pick up in store. And right now, get a free Microsoft Surface Go 2 with the purchase of $1,499 or more. You gift, you get. Limited time offer while supplies last. See online or in-store for details.